Uh, thank you for joining us today for Advanced Echo Teaching in the Critically Ill. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome back to the stage Benny Samadi, uh, who's an intensive care specialist, has uh, advanced echo qualifications with the American Society of Echo. I hope we will soon be going down into the face application process. Um, and uh, it's really kind of Benny to be coming to join us because she is about 35 weeks pregnant. And so it is absolutely wonderful that you're choosing to <laughs> spend your time talking to us well, about advanced echo rather than taking it easy. <laughs> Benny, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I think you're keeping better track of that than I am. <laughs> um, all right, so today I'm going to talk about prosthetic valves. This is very similar to um, the talk that I've previously given, and I will be focusing on aortic and mitral prosthetic valves because there's plenty to cover with just those two, and also tricuspid pulmonary is pretty, pretty uncommon. I doubt we're going to come across it. Um, Okay, so uh, a lot of what I'm talking about is based on uh, the guidelines from the ASC. These are free, Google them, pick them up. And the best thing about these guidelines is that they come with lots of pictures and clips online as well. I'll show you some of them in my talk as well, but they actually demonstrate very nicely the, the, the point they're trying to make. Um, and I did plan on showing you some extra clips from the Nepean Echo Lab, but my computer just completely cacked itself when I tried to load them on. So I apologize, I don't have anything extra. <clears throat> so jumping straight into it, we have, I guess uh, one way you could um, classify valves is by surgical or percutaneous. Um, so the top two are surgical ones. And the, can you see my arrow? on the slides, yeah. So the top one is what we call a stented valve um, and it's got these three struts and they're, they're actually quite identifiable on an echo. So if you see three little e equally equidistant struts, um, that gives you a very good clue that, that, that that's what you're looking at. The second one is um, a stentless um, surgical valve. I find these the trickiest because they have very little um, um, prosthetic material, if you like, around them. So the biological valves, they, um, they're stitched in. And as you can see from this example, that there's actually, they're actually quite hard to identify. Um, you can sometimes see like a suture ring around them. Um, and again, you've got to have a, a pretty good uh, transthoracic probe to see that on a transthoracic echo. Um, and then you have the um, percutaneous, these, these last two are examples of percutaneous valves. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the first one is a stented one. Oh, sorry. At a, um, uh, yeah, and then the, the, this one um, off in the corner here. Can you see? I'm just going to move the zoom box. Um, this one here is a self-expanding. Uh, so these two are uh, percutaneous and it, th these are not um, by any means the only kinds of um, percutaneous valves but they pretty much all look like that. So the self-expanding ones are always like the longer ones and the, um, um, the, the ones that are already um, the ones that already have this um, stent around them, they, they're a little bit shorter. Okay, and these are the um, mechanical uh, types of valves. Um, <clears throat> so by far and away, the most common one that you're gonna see is this bileaflet um, uh, valve. And I think a lot of people might call it like a St. Jude valve because that's quite a common brand, but that's a brand name. So these are called bileaflet mechanical valves. Then probably the next most common one you'll see though far more rarely these days is a single leaflet or a tilting disc um, mechanical valve. And then almost extinct is a ball and cage valve. And I think the I think the, the only value in knowing that the, these bottom two are really because it might come up in an exam, um, but in the many, how many people would you say are on the database at an opinion, Sam, like 
tens of thousands or something like that. Like yeah, lots and lots and lots. Huge, I've right? never seen one of those bull and cage ones. Exactly. And I, 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 I see maybe ones. one every couple of years. Really? Nice. Yeah. They're, they're, they're very characteristic on chest X-ray. It's almost more helpful than it's almost they, more helpful than echo. What do they sound like? I mean, is it just when you listen to the stethoscope? Is it just like dish 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 every time? You, you mistake what kind of doctor I am, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we had a seventy-year-old patient come in, cholangitic, for an emergency lap collie who had a, a star Edwards inside of him a couple of months ago. So we, they're still wow. out in the nature. Uh, still out in nature. Because wow. I think that it's been like a good 20 years they haven't been doing them, right? Like maybe 20, 30 years. So, yeah, yeah, the cardiac surgeons reckon if as long as they don't kill you in the first couple of years, they actually do kind of okay. Yeah, yeah. So And, and everyone you're going to see is going to be very elderly, right? Like yeah. 70 plus, yeah. Um, yeah this uh, is definitely prevalent in RECP clinical exams. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Because I was going to say in that whole, in the whole database at Nepean, I, when I did a search, I found one, one patient with this. Oh, there is and one there, is it? Yeah, there's one, <laughs> one. And then um, there's them out, this I mean. and a handful of the, the tilting disc. Um, and yeah, so I think by far and away, the, the, the bileaflet is the more common one. Um, so... All right, Ben, can you tell me what kind of um, valve this is? That would be a, what looks like it's a tilting disc. I can only see one thing moving in a fairly, well, I can see lots of things moving. I can see uh, one structure uh, that is giving off a solid shadow and I'd call it a tilting disc valve yeah. march position. Yeah, I, yeah, beautiful. That's exactly right. So with the bileaflet, you should see two echogenic structures excuse me and on this one you only see one um and um and it's quite long <laughs> like the bileaflet does not dart that far into the the left ventricle um and jamal what is this what's what's going on uh i think that's going to be a that might be a star edwards yeah yes it is <laughs> good they they don't they never look as impressive as you hope but you can see the top hat arrangement on chest x-ray but they never quite look as impressive as you hope on echo no i'm sure i'm sure um so this uh, the at least a good thing about the star reds with edwards is it's hard to mistake for a different kind of mechanical valve in my opinion because you you can actually kind of see um like a like a bald type structure um jumping up and down in there, I think, to my eye anyway. Um, okay, so when do we want to do an echo? So you do it immediately post-op or perioperative following the procedure. And this is really just to establish the baseline because um, despite the many tables of um, uh, data that you may see, so I'll show you an example. Um, so this is from Benita's book, which is the red one, which is really old. There's like entire tables in the back, right, that just um, give you reference ranges for what's the normal peak pressures, velocities, et cetera, through each of the different kinds of valves. And there's 40 something plus um, valves these days. So um, rather than um, knowing the, what the manufacturer is it considers normal, abnormal, whatever, and all these very precise numbers. Yeah. There's, there's the, the probably the easier or the more common, conventional, accepted way to assess prosthetic valves is to one go by the guidelines that I just talked about, that I just referenced earlier, and <laughs> to, to look at their baseline. So this um, echo that you do operatively is actually to establish what is what is the normal velocity through the valve, what is the normal mean gradient through the valve for this patient with this valve. So that when they have their follow up or if something goes wrong, then they can, um, then you have a reference for them. Um, and obviously you can repeat the echo when there is a clinical reason to, or they say in the guidelines every five to 10 years, just routinely. Hey, Benny, I was just going to let you know, I'm sure you know about it. We've also got, there's a, the British Society of Echo have, I think it's a free app. It's called Echo Calc. 
it's absolutely the business and it's got all that data uh, in it. I don't know whether yeah. you can see it when I put it up like that, but that's yeah. a well, free, free app. It's amazing for all of that data. That's good. And that's expanding too. I think it started off. Very the Americans, uh, sorry, um, <clears throat> it's Jamal here. The Americans have got Valve in Valve. So you, they've got VIV Aortic and VIV Mitral. And these are the apps that a lot of the interventional structural guys use for the Tavers. And it's an amazing app. It's got the pictures of the valves, what they look like, what they appear like. And you select the sizes for the, you know, 50 different kinds of valves and it gives you the expected hemodynamics and stuff. So that, that's also, uh, I, I use that and it, it's very good. That's uh, very well, cool. it, v, VIV Aortic and VIV Mitral are free through the App Store. They're very kind of flash. They've got a lot of pictures and all the images you'd want, and they'll give you, you, know, you pick stented, sutureless, tabby, then oh, the nice. menu goes into the brands, then into the sizes. Um, I, I know the, the other one you're speaking of, but I, I have migrated like the American structural guys to using VIV for my prosthetic stuff. Thanks very much. And who makes that? Uh, one presumes one of the companies that is trying to sell you the valves. Okay. <laughs> all right, cool. Beautiful. Um, okay, so when you come to evaluate prosthetic valves, there before you even pick up a probe, um, I think it's really worth noting um, the history because especially on a trans thoracic, if you don't have good views, you don't have good windows, it can be really, it can actually be kind of difficult to identify what what valve is in there and the, your most reliable piece of information is going to be the history with they're going to have it documented somewhere what kind of valve that is um and you look kind of let me how do i say this nicely you look kind of silly if 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 you call something a bi-leaflet mechanical valve and it's actually single leaflet or vice versa or um if you called it a stented valve and it's not and then the person that that report's going to you know they probably dismiss everything that you say so i would say look at the history the first thing examine the patient um and know what kind of valve it is that you're actually supposed to be assessing um when it was put in and um have that previous echo as um, a baseline if you can um obviously uh, in addition um it would be good to have a body surface area because um, some of the measurements require indexing and, and they're vitals for the same reason. Um, so when it comes to the actual echo, what you want to look at is all of your sort of ancillary kind of information that will tell you something about the valve function. So potentially look at the um, LV, LA, RV, RA, the pulmonary pressures, um, and then uh, with the pros, with the um, biological valves, um, it's you can probably get an idea of the leaflet motion. But with the mechanical valves, um, uh, yeah, and with mechanical valves as well. So you you want to look at the leaflet motion, but just know that, um, and I'll come to this later, um, that particularly in a trans thoracic echo, shadowing is a big is a big problem. Um, so you do need to image it from multiple views. Um, even just to be able to see the, the, the structure of the valve. Um, looking at the valve stability, um, looking for any masses on the valve. Um, multimodal imaging is your friend. Um, I think with transthoracic, the next step, the logical step is a, is a toe. If there's a question that cannot be answered, obviously, but um, the CT and fluoroscopy actually give you highly detailed information. Gated CT can show up a, a clot or panis on the valve and there's you can't see that even with the best echoes you can't really see the clot itself or the panis itself you can infer that there's one there because there's a leaflet not moving and then there's one stuck down and all the other hemodynamic variables but um ct is a gated ct is really good and the fluoroscopy um can tell you a lot um can give you a really clear picture of the leaflet motion particularly for um, mechanical valves um, and then the measurements that you need um, so are pretty similar to what you would do for most uh, for, for a detailed exam even if you're not looking 
um, specifically at the prosthetic uh, valve. So you want to know the LVOT diameter. You want to know the, the velocity, the peak velocity through that valve and the mean gradient um, and the, the VTI. So you can get all of that in, in one uh, image, in one continuous wave Doppler, really. Um, and the uh, and, and pulse wave. And then for the aortic, for, for prosthetic valves and aortic valve position specifically, you want to know the acceleration time because um, that's part of your part of the grading system, part of the assessment. And uh, when it comes to the mitral valve, you want to know about the pressure half time. And I come to why those two things, it's just one bit of extra information, but it really makes a difference. Um, and then obviously you want to look at the jet contour as well, like you, like you always do. Um, and then some derived um, uh, values, uh, calculations, uh, your um, Doppler velocity index, your VTI ratio, and your effective orifice area, which is essentially the continuity um, equation. Um, so this is just showing the um, calculation for effective orifice area. And just noting where you would do, um, where you would make your, your measurement. And I'll come back to that as well. So just note that like you have the stent of the prosthetic valve and you, you measure the LVO2 at the bottom edge of that stent. Um, yeah, does that make sense so far? So a couple of pitfalls. Um, so uh, just note the type of valve. This is um, a, something that they really like to point out in the, in the ASE course. Um, these are long uh, self-expanding valves and uh, even, even the, uh, the, the other type of percutaneous valves, they, when they are inserted, they don't sit flush against the aortic um, root. So you can get a little gap here. See this little gap between the native aortic wall and the um, and the stent. And then some people can mistake that for a dissection or an abscess or a cavity of some kind. So just know that that, that can be normal. You're shaking your head at me, Sam. <laughs> no, 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 I'm laughing because I did exactly that one. So. <laughs> And I called it an abscess, and uh, yeah, I was kindly reminded that was. I think they call it um, was the valve curtain. I think is the term that was used to me, and yeah, I, I've made that mistake before. Yeah, yeah, I think it's quite common actually. It's a common common mistake, and um, and then again, just reiterating where you measure the LVOT. Um, yeah, it has to be at the, at the bottom of the stent, stented part itself, not, um, not at the leaflets. I mean, it's very similar, but um, for example, the longer ones, you need to you do it at the bottom of the stent, uh, the echogenic stent. Shadowing. So just as I briefly mentioned before, you can see that, for example, on an apical four chamber view, if you're looking at um, a, a valve in the mitral position, and if there's significant regurge there, you would not know. And if you have some shadowing here or um, uh, it's a, a, um, a picture where you can't see the left atrium very well, then you would completely, completely miss it in the parasternal as well. There's a significant amount of um, shadowing there. And then similarly, just be aware that you get a considerable amount of shadowing um, uh, with uh, prosthetic valves with anything with some um, uh, with the prosthetic material in there um, namely the the stented mechanical parts um, and with this aortic uh, in the aortic valve position especially in the parasternal view you actually can't make out anything from from the valve at all it shadows itself completely in this position um, uh, so another pitfall is um, basically just not getting an accurate measurement. And I think, I mean, this is true for, for, for anything in ECHO really. Um, just know that you, um, to just know that you need to get the best alignment you can. Um, and this is so common for prosthetic 
valves that um, when you're looking at the, um, when you're assessing an aortic valve for stenosis, for example, uh, when you go down this pathway to decide why you're getting such high velocities, is it because um, there's high flows? Is it because that valve stenosed and obstructed? Or is it patient prosthesis mismatch? Um, of the various pathways you can follow, two of the four branches here end up with something saying you've probably measured it wrong. So it's pretty common. Um, and it's, it's, it's just try and be as accurate as you, as you can because um, this doesn't make sense if you um, have uh, like high, high velocities and then a early peaking, for example, high velocities and an early peaking um, uh, uh, jet um, with a short acceleration time. Does that make sense? And then here they've said L improper LVO2 velocity as well, underestimated gradient. So it's quite common. Um, also, if, if you can just take away one message from this, from this talk, it's that you can't base um, your assessment of prosthetic valves on a gradient alone. It, you can't use that one measure. Whereas I think with, with native valves, very much you can kind of um, just look at the gradient and the velocity and, and, the, and the valve structure itself and, and make a probably an accurate conclusion. That's not the case because you don't know one, whether it's regurge with higher volumes causing that higher gradient. So it, it, may, actually, it may actually be a regur very regurgitant valve, not stenosed at all. And then um, to uh, classify, you, need, you actually need things like the acceleration time and you need the um, jet contour as well. <clears throat> and just be aware of the flow profiles. So for the bi-leaflet valve, um, that there's that in between the leaflets, there's a very narrow area. And if your Doppler, uh, continuous wave Doppler happens to sit in, in there, you're gonna get falsely high, um, falsely high um, uh, gradients. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so some of the pathologies that you can see <clears throat> with the biological valves, you get you get wear and tear and what they call primary failure, just like as you would with um, a native valve. Um, that obviously doesn't apply to the mechanical valves, but you can get everything else with both types. Um, so you can get calcification, panis, and thrombosis formation, and really which one's which is going to be a matter of um, the timeline. So if um, your stenosis and, and obstruction of that valve happens very quickly. There's probably a thrombus if it's happened very slowly over time. That's probably a panis formation. Um, and endocarditis um, and uh, dehiscence. I'll show you some examples later. So types of regurg. So physiological. Um, so um, the, the physiological regurg you see would happen at the, at the hinges. And um, when it's if it's not pathological re regurg, or if it's normal normal regurg, it's it's going to happen within the um, the valve ring. So, I mean, obviously, if there's regurg outside of the valve ring, that would indicate that there's dehiscence. Um, and then the other type of physiological regurg is closing volume, and this is probably you do see it with all of the different kinds of mechanical valves. Um, but probably the most, um, I think, significant would have been with the bowl and cage valve. Um, but you do see a little bit of a cl closing volume with um, the tilting disc, and the, the bileaflet. And that closing volume uh, regurg just means that when that, um, when the leaflet is coming to close, there's that a certain volume, very, very small volume of blood, which gets displaced as the leaflets close and that displaces backwards into the atria. Um, and then pathological. So for the um, bioprosthetic valves, that's usually central, similar to native valves. Um, <clears throat> and then paravalvular, which would originate outside of the prosthetic ring um, and that's usually for 
when we're talking about that, we talk about um, mechanical valves and tabbies, though it can happen with, with any valve if it becomes dehissed. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about um, aortic valve um, prosthesis stenosis, sometimes referred to as obstruction. So this is the table from the guidelines. And um, what, I will look at this table to, to look at um, whether something is um, stenosed or not, because I can't remember all these numbers. <clears throat> but the main thing I want to draw your attention to is one, it's not the same as native valves. And two, there is no grading for stenosis. Of, of any of the prosthetic valves. It, it's either normal, possible stenosis, or yeah, definitely they've got stenosis. Um, there's a grading of mild, moderate, and severe for regurg, but not for stenosis. Uh, so, and this is, a, I'm laboring the point because it's quite a common mistake that I came across with um, uh, some of the echo reports that I read. Um, so you use the velocity mean gradient as a starting point, but that can't tell you everything. You really do need um, the Doppler velocity index. And I kind of skip over the next couple, but the acceleration time is quite helpful as well. Um, and that's really just to differentiate your whether you're getting high flows because there's regurg or something else going on and it's not just stenosis. So we'll do um, case. Oh, sorry. I'll, uh, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Um, I've been watching a couple of the uh, um, ASCE exam course lecture things like that they do. Mm -hmm. And I watched one on aortic valves the other day or prosthetic aortic valves. And they talked about um, acceleration time, ejection time ratio, stuff like that. Do you ever use that? Oh, no. No? Okay. No, I don't. I know you can, but like it's pretty this is i think this is complicated enough as it is i completely agree <laughs> like, it's gonna make you do, like the minimum number of measurements you have to right <laughs> oh good yeah um yeah sorry i'm not that dedicated <laughs> um uh yeah so um uh just to show you an example of normal versus stenosis so like like a native valve, I think your jet contour gives you a lot of information. Um, you you know you get that rounded parabolic shape when it's stenosed. Um, early peaking, if it's not, that 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 should be normal. Um, and then the other thing that I, I want to draw your attention to is with mechanical valves, you a good if you can't actually see well enough, you can't figure out, is this even mechanical or is it like a stent, stented um, biprosthetic valve? I can't tell. Uh, if you put a continuous wave down there, you get these very echogenic bars for a mechanical valve. And it's a good, good giveaway. So as soon as you see that, you go, oh, that's, that's a mechanical valve. Um, <clears throat> so for the... No, I think, can I add one thing? Just yeah. um, obviously, if it's a, if you've got a massive thrombus or anything, it's stopping the movement of it. You can sometimes miss one of those if it's obstructed. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Um, so here we see mean gradient twenty two. It's kind of borderline, um, but your Doppler velocity index is fine, and your acceleration time is definitely less than eighty. So this is normal. Um, and it, it and the velocity is two point eight, so it kind of goes to show you that you know you you can't rely on a, on a gradient velocity alone to tell you anything about the of prosthetic about prosthetic valves. Um, and then here we have an example of stoes one very high velocity, very high mean gradient, very low DVI, um, and a very prolonged ET. It's quite quite a an obvious example. Um, and yeah, so just going down the, if we want to go down the, the um, flow chart. So we had a, a, a velocity that was high, uh, DVI that was very low, and then acceleration time is very high. So here we go, suggest prosthetic aortic valve stenosis. Um, and this is just to, just to remind you of the, um, uh, calculations again again 
of your Doppler velocity index and your effective orifice area. And this is always going to be proximal over distal is the, is the way I remember it. Because when you do the mitral valve, it's mitral valve over LVOT. So uh, we're talking about aortic valve here. So it's the LVOT over the aortic valve jet, proximal over distal. Um, yeah. Okay, so here's another, here's an example. And I've, I've got a list of the YouTube clips that I've used for this talk at the end. I think they're actually very good clip, good videos if you have the time to watch them um, in their entirety. Here we go. So um, the first thing is probably worth noting is that you can't see anything in this valve. Like this is a parasternal long axis. And like, I, I can't actually see anything of the valve structure here. Um, which which makes these measurements really important because you can't physically see what's going on with the valve. So for this one, I've just made it a bit bigger. So the peak velocity is five meters per second. The mean gradient is very high, 66. The Doppler velocity index is quite low and the acceleration time is prolonged. So on the short axis view, you can see, this is what I was referring to before, <clears throat> these nice little struts. Sorry, I'll just go back. I'll just pause it, pause it there. Um, so you can see these three little struts and they're kind of equidistant inside. Um, and that's the, that's the stented uh, surgical bioprosthetic valve. So that's a, that's a good giveaway. Um, so Ben, what do you think is going on with this valve? Running through the algorithm tree you had up before, it's gonna fit down with um, stenosis of the bioprosthetic aortic valve all the numbers feed down that that way and everything is I mean you have to be nice to go back and know what kind of valve it is and check like what its baselines are but there's no way they're going to be those numbers um but yeah exactly yeah so this is pretty um everything falls on to one side of that um of the table as well so so this is very very much stenosis you can confidently say that and then they have um the reason why I like this um, this YouTube clip is because then they have a CT scan showing what's going on. And then on the CT, this is what I was talking about, the, the detail that you can see, you can actually see the thrombus um, on the valve leaflets. So, um, yeah. Um, do I have another? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, going down here and then you get suggest prosthetic AV stenosis. Um, yeah, and everything falls on that, on this end of it. So there's no ambiguity. Here's an example of a valve that's been taken out with, um, with a panis. Um, this is what the panis looks like. And as you can see, it's completely, it's stuck on leaflet. Um, in an open position, actually. So um, this person may have had stenosis and regurge. Um, and um, I'm just put this up here. Um, this is, I think this is quite a complicated um, thing to get your head around, um, but I've just put it up here just so you know that patient prosthesis is a thing that <laughs> exists. And um, if you're if you're really keen to diagnose it, there's there's a tables to to figure out what's going on. But essentially, what it is is when the valve that's been put into a patient is too small for that patient, um, and then they get the they get essentially something like a like a mild obstructive physiology because they've permanently got a even though the valve itself is working fine for them, for their body size and for their blood volume, it's equivalent to stenosis for them, um, uh, physiologically speaking, because it's just too small. 
So um, aortic uh, valve prosthesis regurg. Um, so the good news is this is actually fairly similar to native valves and there is a grading of mild, moderate and severe. And I think with with similar to native valves, I prefer to actually go off um, the uh, qualitative measurements rather than quantitative measurements. So I will look at um, underlying the things that I probably rely on the most he heavily. Um, uh, be interested to hear from you guys what you guys do. So I just I look at things like the the regurg. Uh, the amount of regurges it takes up the LVOT diameter. I look at um, the density of the regurge jet and the, the pressure half time to a degree. I think, you know, if you have a faint regurge jet, you can probably measure that, that slope to be whatever you want it to be. <laughs> um, but sometimes if it's dense and it's clear, it can be helpful. Um, and I look at diastolic flow reversal on the descending aorta. I think that's a nice one to, to tell you it's severe. Uh, what do you guys do? I was just going to highlight the importance of the 2D appearance. You know, if you've got any kind of abnormality in there, even if you've got all this shadowing around, you can sometimes find some of it difficult on both toe and transthoracic. But if you can see some kind of 2D abnormality, it's got to point to you that there's something very messed up going on there. Um, so I just think 2D features are important as well. Like LV size and that, that kind of thing. Yeah, just, I mean, just the valve anatomy as well. Just oh, if you're yeah. seeing something that's, uh, for example, if it's infective endocarditis, if you're seeing something floating around, and you're umming and ahhing about whether it's you know moderate or severe, you know, going to be linked to severe. And just a big fan of the diastolic flow reversal in the aorta because you can't mess that one up, right? The other, the other ones, it's easy to mess that up, but that that one's harder to mess up. Yeah, I agree. Uh, what do you what do you guys do, Ben Jamal? Oh, um, my there too. Hello. <laughs> oh yeah. So it's Jamal here. My my experience with valves is is very different. I, I'd imagine. Um, usually, usually we're assessing them in the immediate post uh, post post pump procedure to see whether or not they're acceptable. And with the um, with the surgically placed aortic valve prosthesis, um, they would tolerate very little in the way of leak. So, you know, we almost never quantify it, but if qu qualitatively there's anything more than a trace regurgitation in a newly minted aortic valve, that's usually considered, um, you know, uh, intolerable and they'll go back on to fix that. The other area that I do a lot of echo is post tabbies. And uh, in a lot of the tabby literature, there was a lot of paravalvular leak just the way that they're implanted within the native yeah. annulus. And so a lot of the time, um, the classification for paravalvular leak around uh, the skirt of the tabby valves is related to the circumference. Uh, the, you know, and so anything larger than 30% uh, is considered like severe. And that's interesting because some of the, some of the data, they've done some analysis of some of the tabby data yeah. from the partner trials. And unsurprisingly, uh, the degree of paravalvular leak in relation to circumference is proportional to patient outcomes. So they will do worse mm -hmm. if they have a bigger circumferential leak with a tabby valve. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's largely semi-qualitative, but it's slightly different if it's a surgically implanted valve or a tabby valve. And I imagine the hemodynamics of the patient at that time as well play a significant role in um, what you're willing to tolerate. Because I imagine, you know, immediately well, it, well, they're still on the table and perioperatively, like you're keeping the blood pressures quite low and, the, you know, everything's very controlled. So even a little bit of um, regurge would be concerning because there shouldn't really be any afterload that um, yeah, the, would be exacerbating it. And, uh, and we, that's in this kind of hyperdynamic, high flow post pump situation. Sometimes we are called upon to do these um, these uh, patient processes mismatch calculations. Mm. So if you've got a small lady with a bit of annular calcification and they can only get a 21 in her, but she weighs 130 kilos, um, you might be, they might end up getting patient processes mismatch and you'll get them off the table, but they'll just have intolerable symptoms. Mm -hmm. So we might have to assess for patient processes mismatch in the immediate high flow, hyperdynamic pump, post pump situation. And if it's intolerable, then they'll have to go back on and do some kind of, you know, patch annular um, widening and then try and get a, a 23 in or something. Mm. That'd be quite complicated, I imagine, surgically as well. 
well, the, the surgeons are very understanding and give us plenty of time to do a thorough echo analysis. So that's always good. Yeah, that's great. They do none of those things. <laughs> In a perfect world. Um, so this uh, slide is just to tell you about, just again, to give you the, the calculations that you need if you want to do a quantitative analysis, which I think is, uh, I mean, to be honest, like I think very laborious and also um, prone to error. Um, every time I've tried to, um, even for native valves, um, uh, so you can do this for both prosthetic and native valves, uh, but every time I've tried to do a, a regurgitant fraction, for example, it's, it's, it's been very unhelpful and I, I didn't think it was contributory to my assessment, but it's there if you, if you want to do it. Um, so this is just, uh, just trying try to move the zoom box so I can see. So uh, this, so this is an example of um, paravalvular leak. So you can see um, for this uh, for this valve, it's, it's quite significant jutting straight across the um, the LVOT. Um, this is a, a, a toe, uh, obviously, which which gives you better a better idea of it because I uh, imagine on the um, transthoracic there was uh, too much shadowing to to appreciate this, and there's that diastolic uh, flow reversal. Um, and some works. Yes, and then we have the videos of the same same patient. Um, so you can see on the short axis, um, coming from outside the ring, there's quite a lot of uh, there's, there's this jet of regurg that comes across down that way, and then on the um, long uh, axis, uh, the jet comes across and then shoots straight across the LVOT. Okay, so moving on to mitral valves. So unfortunately, there's a whole different set of parameters for the mitral valve. Um, the good news is, I think this is probably a little bit more straightforward. So you have your peak and mean gradients <clears throat> to look at and your VTI ratio, again, proximal over distal. <clears throat> I kind of skip over the EOA, but you know how to do it. Um, and then the pressure half time, I think, is the, is the, is the pivot point because all of this stuff is going to be high all of these first three are going to be high if it's um, uh, stenosis um, or if it's regurg. But if you have a very rapid pressure equalization in the cavities across the mitral valve, then um, the very rapid pressure equalization will give you a short pressure half time, and that points to regurg being the cause of your mean gradient and high velocity, high, high mean gradient, and high velocity. Um, so here's an example of uh, normal and one uh, obstructed. And again, it looks pretty similar to the contour you'd expect from a um, um, a native valve, and this is a this is a bioprosthetic valve. Um, here we see high velocity, high gradient, high pressure half time. Um, so that tells you that this is a stenosed obstructed vessel. I think that I think the pressure. I'm kind of laboring the point because pressure half time gets neglected and forgotten about often, but it, I think you really need it to differentiate your regurg from your stenosis. Um, and here's a, <clears throat> another example where your main gradient is quite high. And this is due to a big um, thrombus on the valve, uh, occluding one of the leaflets completely. And this is. Um, yeah, uh, this is after the, the same patient's been treated. Um, and I've just included this just to remind you how to do the pressure half time on the mitral valve. Um, so you start at the, the peak and go down the, 
um, uh, go down this um, gradient, this E, e wave essentially. Uh, sorry, the pressure half time. Yeah, did I say that? Yeah, this is how you do the pressure half time. Um, and then of note, you can't use, so for a native valve, you can use the pressure half time to very easily just calculate the mitral valve area, but you can't do that with prostate valves. You can't do that with um, percutaneous or uh, valve repairs or anything where the valve has been tampered with. Uh, it only works for untouched native valves. Um, all right, so is that Hassan behind you, Sam? Yeah, hello. Do you want to? He was thinking he was going to get away with it. Uh, I, you, not I can see you. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is uh, an aortic long axis view on transverse gel echocardiogram, and I can see a prosthetic valve in the mitral position. Yep. Uh, with uh, underlying shadowing. So from the 2D image, I can see that one of the leaflets is potentially uh, not opening, just one leaf is opening. I can't differentiate which is which of this from this view. Um, what, um, what kind of valve is it? Uh, it looks like a uh, bi leaflet. Uh, Mechanical valve. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah ex excellent. Yeah, so I agree. Like, so this this um, this leaflet is moving quite freely, and then the one on the other side, you can't you can't you can appreciate this. It's not really moving at all, um, and it's obstructed there. Cool. Um, and then mitral valve regurg. We we'll just go over very quickly as well. Um, so. Do you want to have a go at this one as well? So that's a uh, mid gel view, cross gel uh, scan, and this again showing prosthetic valve in the mitral position. Uh, there is, I'm not entirely sure whether there is a uh, left appendage thrombus as well that was evident on the previous one, or there's at least some thrombus that's attached to the posterior mitral valve leaflet from the atrial side. There is uh, extensive regurg that's happening across the mitral valve from the prosthetic view and it's posteriorly. It's, there's two jets that I can identify. There is a posterior direct jet and there is uh, a central jet from the quick snap view that I've been able to see. And is the, is the regurg coming from within the valve or I think it's coming valve. it's coming paravalvular one of them one of the jets is coming paravalvular towards this area of the obstruction toward the uh, so possibly there's uh valvular adhesions happening at this yeah yeah so yeah possibly exactly. uh possibly Th there is no, yeah. there is yeah. yeah 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 so I think in particularly in the exam and I think you've got to be careful with your language in yeah. there because you know, in the exam, we don't. We, if you're doing this study, we don't want you to be sitting on the fence, right? You know, this you can see that whole annulus is lifting it's off lifting and this off. horrific regurg. These are the two D changes I was talking about. So even looking at the view on the left, you'd say that this has got to be associated with severe regurg because the whole valve is lifting up. You know, this is not the time to be sitting on the fence. You know, we want to be hearing the candidate saying this is a medical emergency. This is phoning anyone you can think of and telling them about this. You know, yeah. it's um. Yeah, particularly surgeons. I'm not being really flippant, but that's uh, so just be careful with the man. It's not possible. It is. It is. You know, this is this is severe regurgitation. This is valvular dehiscence. This is a medical emergency. Yeah. Nice. yeah. So I think the leaflets, um, the mechanical leaflets, are actually moving quite well, and um, the pathology is that the 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 valve is rocking. So this is what they refer to as the rocking motion of the valve because the whole ring is um, dehissed. And this, what you, I think you called a clot, is probably vegetation, mm. um, not a clot, but... Um, Independent yeah, so um, 
Yes, so this this is, yeah, I agree, an emergency, this valve's coming coming off. Yeah, it wouldn't be real, I think, yeah, just keep it as the... Um, and you can see the, the, the motion, these, yeah, yeah, these yeah, two echogenic structures, the two leaflets in there. Actually, like, it could be from this, absolutely could be from this. quite well. Could be just, yeah, just keep that differential, but say what you see. Moving on, um, so some of the, um, again, similar to, to prosthetic valves in the aortic position, in the mitral position, you can classify them into mild, moderate and severe regurg um, based on, again, I've underlined some of the stuff that I use, which I think really, at the end of the day, I think colour is your friend, seeing it on colour Doppler, and that really highlights the importance of getting around the shadowing or doing a toe. Um, and uh, and then the, using using the the contour um, the characteristics of the contour as well. Um, uh, I think I'll just I think we're almost at the end here. So this is um, another example of um, of uh, severe paravalvular regurg. Um, and it's just demonstrating how on the transthoracic there's so much shadowing that you really can't actually appreciate that there's much regurg there. And then when you go to the toe, you can see it's very severe and the whole valve is dehissed. De I think this is a clip, the same thing. Nope, not loading for me. Sorry. Sorry, guys working for some reason. Um, and then again, um, uh, looking at some of the flow profiles. So your, your gradient and your peak velocity are gonna be high. And then you have some pulmonary um, hypertension as well. But um, uh, you, this actually doesn't, and this actually doesn't tell you, uh, you, you can see from the, the contour um, that this is probably regurg. Um, but the, the measurements themselves don't tell you whether this is regurg or stenosis because this could still be stenosis. So what you really need, because they're all here, so what you really need is pressure half time. Um, and then uh, when, if you do the pressure half time, quite short, then you go, okay, this is regurg. And um, that's all I have to say about that. So I do want to show you some additional clips, sorry, from the, from the Nepean Echo Lab, but my computer just cacked itself when I tried to load them, so. That's what I mean, that was a great talk, what a fantastic overview of all of it. Um, the videos that you were getting, so that's just off the ASC review course. Uh, and one, two, the guidelines, three, yeah, yeah. Get those so, off the internet, yeah. can you? Uh, brilliant. Yeah. So they're free, you can access them, just Google it. Um, the the ASC that they have um, they have videos associated with they have a lot of examples actually. So I like the one as well with the the guys almost like reporting at the legends. It's there looks to be like an eminent cardiologist with one of his <laughs> junior consultants. I like that. That's, um, yes. I see that one. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a, that's quite a nice one, and there are quite. Um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of uh, lectures on YouTube about prosthetic valve assessment and they all sound exactly the same. They're like exactly the same. <laughs> this is the best. Right? Through the guidelines and this is what it looks like and this is, yeah, so they all sound exactly the same. So um, some of those ones that I use, are, they just have some really good images as examples. But on, when you go online and you look at the ASE guidelines for this, It'll give you this, and then it'll show you a little, like a little, it'll have a little camera thing down the bottom. So this is this is the best guideline that they've ever written. I thought it was extremely clinically relevant, easy to, you know, use. It, it, it's a really well done paper. Some of the other ones can be a little nebulous. I mean, I'm sitting thinking like diastolic dysfunction or yeah, you know, valvular <laughs> native valve analysis. It's a yeah. little dry and hard to read. This one, I I, I yeah. thought it was fantastic. Well, they leave you with more questions than when you yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, are there any questions for Benny? Um, I, I guess my, my just say again, say thanks very much for giving that lecture. And just my one comment to the guys doing the exam is that this is quite commonly asked both in the written and the vivas because it's, you know, there's a, a lot to recognize in there. It's obviously highly clinically relevant and 
you know, there's an obvious, uh, you know, if we're showing you a vowel, there's normally something wrong with it, right? And, um, and you've got to be putting clinical and echo features together. Uh, so it's definitely worth knowing this. I think a structure that Benny's outlined in this talk is really important. So in the Viva, for example, they would ask you about how to assess the severity of this. We're not asking for a 15 minute answer, just, just the, the big headings, you know, as, as Benny said, you're looking for, you know, 2D features, um, you know, maybe if it's the aortic valve, looking for your VTI uh, changes, the DSI across them, looking for your acceleration time, you know, just giving us those highlight features uh, and, you know, how you then put it into the clinical scenario. So, yeah, common questions, have a framework in your head about how to answer it systematically and efficiently in quite a short period of time, I think would be the code. Cool. Benny, thank you very, very much thank indeed. You. Best thank of luck you. with the rest of your pregnancy. Thanks, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thanks, guys. If you learned something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for watching. watching.